cool. Hi everyone, my name is Tommy Long. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you, to you today about agile practices for securing your SME applications. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords in there, but what I'm looking to do is to impart some knowledge, uh, try and raise some awareness around security, uh, and hopefully provide some guidance and um, some tips on what you can take away and actually introduce into your agile processes. Um, ideally, I'd love to see like some tweets tomorrow saying, do you know what, I, I watched this talk last night and I'm now doing my planning sessions differently. That'd be really cool. That's what I'm aiming for, but we'll see how we go. Uh, so here's a little bit about me. Apart from the likeness, that profile picture, um, if you go looking for me on the internet, that's who you'll find. Spike from Gremlins. Uh, you've got my Twitter details and my, my email here. Uh, if you have any questions after the event, obviously we've got the normal .NET Bournemouth points of contact, but if you want to speak to me personally, that's me. Um, I am a software, senior software developer for Gilmond. Uh, I've been developing for around 10 years. Um, I've worked for a variety of industries, so I've done everything from actually being in the army to writing software for asset management for fire services to what I'm currently doing, which is the uh, software for the energy sector. Um, across all of those, maybe not so much the army, but across all of the software roles, security is always going to be there, and it's something that's always been of interest to me. Um, and actually, it's something that we've had to dig into an awful lot at, at Gilman over the last six months. So I wanted to share some of what we've learned. So this is why we learn about security. The last thing I want to do tonight is, is come in and have a WannaCry pop up and uh, charge me $300 worth of Bitcoins. Um, this isn't necessarily the best example for a, a software developer crowd um, because a lot of people would probably argue that the failure goes down to IT departments and Windows updates and, and etc. Whether you want to argue it that way or not, here's a little bit of information about WannaCry. Um, it was launched in May this year. I, I assume everybody heard of it. It was in the news. Uh, it was quite high profile. Uh, it infected over 230,000 machines within 24 hours uh, across 150 countries. So whilst our news feeds might have been quite specific to things like the NHS, um, it was actually much more widespread than that. What was interesting about WannaCry in particular is, uh, you'll see at the bottom there, it was fixed two months prior to its launch. Um, Windows Update was available to patch over the vulnerability that was exploited by this malware. Um, it just hadn't been deployed by IT departments across various industries. <clears throat> it's not just WannaCry. I'm actually just going to switch to uh, another screen here. It's not just these bits of malware that we're talking about today. Um, this here, oh, if I'm able to get it onto the right screen. There we go. Try again. Oh, nearly. Where'd it go? <laughs> That's a very good bit of Maui. Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe I do have one to cry. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this is a, a website. If it loads correctly, it's obviously going to display very well here. Um, what that would ideally be is a world map. Uh, this is something that T-Mobile runs. Uh, these little red spots that are popping up here, these lines that are getting drawn across the, the map, these are live attacks. These are ongoing right now. This is a website that has, uh, like I said, T-Mobile runs. They've got 180 centers across the, uh, across the world. Uh, and basically, every time somebody scans a, a vulnerable point or uh, attempts to exploit something on one of their sensors, they flag it to a centralized computer and they display it here. Um, you can imagine there's an awful lot going on all around the world. This is only of the 180 sensors that they've got deployed. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of stuff going on all the time. It's not just things high profile things like malware, uh, like WannaCry. Uh, I saw Troy Hunt today announced another breach. I can't remember the company name, USA B2B. Lost another 105 million records today. <clears throat> All right, so this is just one example. Uh, security is a much broader context than this. Um, I appreciate these charts aren't very easy to read on slides, but what we have here, this is from Wikipedia. It's not massively accurate, uh, especially if you were to look at the source data for something like Have I Been Pawned. 
but even according to Wikipedia, we're talking in 2011, uh, 1.4 billion records, customer records, were captured uh, across uh, something like six attacks. Um, whilst there is some spikes in here, the, I would say the trend does seem to be on the incline. Uh, so before we go much further on this, I want to make sure that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. We all understand the same terminology. Uh, I'm going to walk through some of the, the key stuff, uh, just so that we're all, we all understand. So the big boogeyman when it comes to security, uh, when, you, when you look at this on the internet, is threat. That is the key word. It's the top of the tree. Uh, if you go looking for a definition for threat, however, you'll find a different answer on every website you go to. Um, here's one. This is from threatanalysis.com. Anything that can exploit a vulnerability intentionally or accidentally and obtain damage or destroy an asset. Uh, personally, I think, whilst that might be a brilliant definition, on first glance, that probably asks more questions, uh, raises more questions than it does answer. What is an exploit? What is a vulnerability? What is an asset? We'll look at a, another definition here. This is from ICANN. A threat may be an expressed or demonstrated intent expressed or demonstrated intent to harm an asset or cause it to become unavailable. Um, this one has less of those buzzwords, but it does highlight asset again. If you have a look at what an asset is in a security context. Um, there's a couple obvious ones, I suppose. People and property, they are assets to companies. Um, they probably don't apply so much to us as software developers. Uh, some of us may be responsible for protecting people and property, um, but actually the, the key bit of asset is information. So if we dig deeper into information, what kind of information are we talking about? Obvious one, customer databases. These go missing all the time. They are high value. Uh, criminals are able to sell these. Um, we, we are not doing good enough at protecting our customer databases. This is abundantly clear. Go look at Have I Been Poor and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, see how many times your email address has been breached as a result of people not looking after their customer databases. Another example here, an employee database. This is less common, but uh, it's definitely something you want to protect. So we're not talking here necessarily about uh, names and addresses of employees or their email addresses, which to some extent might be publicly available, certainly the email addresses and such. Um, what we're talking here is what about their salaries? Um, what about disciplinary procedures that they might have had? Uh, the last thing you want when you turn up to a job interview is for the, the person on the other end of the table to go, I googled you and the first thing that came up was a disciplinary from 2006. <clears throat> company records, this one's uh, probably less obvious but we're talking about the financial legal records that a company holds. Uh, a lot of us probably won't deal with those directly but we still need to protect our systems to make sure that uh, further attacks aren't available. If one of our, our component that we are responsible for is vulnerable, and gives uh, uh, an attacker access to other parts of our network, our system, our company infrastructure, then we could be exposing this, these company records. Internal notes, uh, again, not necessarily obvious. What we're talking about here, things like Slack. How would your manager feel if he saw the note that you send to, sent to your friend last week, uh, a snidey remark about their shoes? Um, it's not just Slack, it, it's any kind of internal information that you, you might be passing between one another that you probably consider private. You don't want that stuff leaked, you don't want it public. Passwords, <laughs> a really obvious one. Uh, got a little demo for you here. Uh, if you haven't done this before, this is actually really quite, well, I think it's quite interesting. If I can get a, uh, a mouse up here. So, oh. what I'm gonna do is, hopefully that's very, mostly visible. I'm just going to go to GitHub onto the advanced search. I don't know who's used this before. Can you see where I'm going with this? It's not just about talking, uh, it's not just about letting attackers get into your system. It is where you are storing your passwords. There is 318,000 public commits on GitHub where they've removed their password. Like, if I can navigate to this, bear in mind we're on another screen. I'm just picking one at random here. I haven't checked these today. Uh, let's have a scroll. There's no guarantee that there'll be one in here. Uh, we kind of, it looks like some password information to me here. 
like this is all publicly available. People have bots that sit and scan commits across all of GitHub all day, just waiting for you to make this kind of slip up. <coughs> source code. Uh, this isn't going to be so important for people that are doing mostly open source stuff, um, but you can imagine source code it is IP of your company. A lot of your unique selling points, a lot of the stuff that makes your company money is held in your source code. You don't want to be giving that away. Uh, you've also got the flip side of that. If there are dubious security practices in your software, whether you're aware of it or not, they're going to become very quickly evident. API keys. Uh, I could go back to GitHub and search for remove API keys. I've got a feeling I'd, I'd get a few more commits than I did for passwords. It's not just about how you're storing those API keys uh, in your inside your company, it's, well, where are you committing this stuff to? Where are you storing it? Uh, same, same thing, certificate keys. So um, a lot of people here, I imagine, have uh, had to apply for a TLS certificate or similar. Um, where did the private key go for that? Because a lot of people uh, are used to using maybe MakeCert for private keys and, and generating self-signed certificates, and maybe follow a similar process for generating a secure certificate for their official company domain. Where did that private key go? Is it, is, it still on your desk, uh, is it still on your laptop? If your laptop gets nicked, what's the point in that? So we've had a look at what kind of information people are trying to get at, what they're trying to take from you or damage or destroy. Um, so who are these people? Uh, well, we saw WannaCry earlier. Uh, that was, uh, would fall under organized crime. Um, we're talking the, the professionals here, the guys that are in it to make big money. Um, they spend an awful lot of time, they put an awful lot of resources into this very dangerous group. They are not necessarily, though, the most applicable to you or I. Um, we're not working at PayPal, we're not working at uh, you know, uh, big companies, we are the small vendors, hopefully using trusted technologies. But the same group will go after what you, the, the, those trusted technologies that you rely upon. So we're still vulnerable to them, even if we don't think we're going to be directly attacked. Malware we saw earlier. So malware on itself um, can be a threat in the case of WannaCry. Uh, but traditionally what we're talking about here is something that is scanning all the time. So we saw on the live map earlier, these things are just poking and looking for holes in security all the time. Um, typically they won't, like I say, won't do damage unto themselves. But what they'll do is they will find where your weaknesses are, store them somewhere some centralized, and that information then becomes available to organized crime or another kind of attacker. Script kiddies. Um, these are my favorite. I was probably one myself when I was a bit younger. These are people who typically are more motivated by maybe notoriety. Um, they're trying to look cool to their friends. Uh, maybe they have a political agenda. We're talking people like Anonymous. They are, it's not that they're not technical. They're usually not uh, as professional or as knowledgeable as the organized crime group. But they have access to all these resources that the organized crime people have made available. So we're talking things like Google Docs. Kids love to do these things. There's a list of uh, phrases that you can type into Google that will point out a vulnerable website to you. They don't care who that vulnerable website is. They're going to do it just because they can. <coughs> Motivated. So this is a little bit different. Um, we're talking here, there's a couple sides um, of the motivated spectrum here. If you, if you are working with a customer base and you annoy a customer, what if that customer is really good with computers? <laughs> what are they going to do to your system? <laughs> There's not lot, a lot that you or I can maybe do about that because we're, prob we're probably not in the customer service department. But we do need to protect our software from people make, doing that kind of thing. You've also got the other side of it. Um, employees, disgruntled employees. Somebody feels that they've been wronged. Now, they are potentially even more of a threat because not only do they have some technical experience, but they know how your company works. They know your, your security measures, all the, everything technical within your company. How much damage could a single person do, any one of you, do to your systems if you wanted to? White Hat, these are typically security researchers. Um, hopefully, ethical White Hat um, attackers. These are people that, um, hopefully, scan websites or um, scan for vulnerabilities and 
ideally provide that information to the, to the owners, to the authors. It's also accidental. Um, it can't be ignored. If you put a button on your website that says don't click this, which does some harm, your users are going to click it. Um, OK, that's an obviously arbitrary, abstract example. But if you're not careful with the permissions on your system, what are your normal users getting access to? You can't blame them if they click a button that you've made available or you've not protected. So we know a little bit about what information people are trying to get or destroy. We know a little bit about who or why. Um, how? Uh, well, the answer is I don't know. I, I can't give you a, a list of ways that people are going to attack your system. It's just not possible. Uh, and by the time I told you the list, it would have changed. So what we need to do is examine your system and hopefully give you the tools to assess your system yourself and identify the vulnerabilities yourself. So there's a couple of ways to, uh, to break down a system. Uh, a lot of these we probably already do when we're communicating with our peers, uh, when we're, we're talking to our product owners or other developers. We probably already do this stuff. It's probably just called something else. Abstract example here of a little bit of a whiteboard drawing. Uh, who does whiteboard drawings? Pretty much, uh, good, good for you. Um, Another example, this is something I did like years ago. These are really useful for communicating to your team. It's very easy to stand in front of a wall or a whiteboard and, and point out how things are moving around your system. And what I'm going to be changing this because of this. And it's a very good communication tool, I think. Um, the same tool that hopefully some of us are already using can be used when you're assessing for security vulnerabilities. Um, this is only one part of the picture, but breaking your system down into its fundamental components is a really good place to start. Next, we look at data flows. So you now know what the pieces of the puzzle are, what data is moving through them. Bearing in mind that data is your information asset. That is the thing that you are trying to protect. <clears throat> Every time you, in fact, I'll skip this for now. The final piece. So hopefully by now you have a, a, a list of components or a diagram of components. You have a list of various bits of data that go through your system. Uh, the final piece of this puzzle is the trust boundaries. Uh, what components do you own? What parts of your system are, say, a third party service that you're calling out to? Uh, in what cases is data flowing into your system? Are you importing data from another provider? Is your customer, your end user? Uh, providing bits of data. Every time you are not the author, the owner of the data, or you pass that data to someone else, you cross a trust boundary. Now, the trust boundaries are where you want to apply the most scrutiny. We talked earlier about motivated attackers. A motivated attacker is hopefully the most serious threat to the, your system scope. But everything, all the other attackers are typically going to be attacking from outside of the trust boundary. So when's a good time to integrate this into your agile process? Uh, I appreciate we've not covered everything, but we, we'll go more into threat analysis and threat modeling. Given that you want to break your system down into its components, into its data flows, into its trust boundaries, when's a good time to be examining that? Um, I, hopefully everybody here is following some kind of agile methodology, be it Scrum or Kanban or something along those lines. Is everybody doing that? Anybody not doing agile? You're not doing agile? Um, the same process, so I'll, I'll describe it as if you are, um, but it will still work anyway. Um, I will assume that you will follow some kind of planning implementation review process, it will still fit into that. Um, so planning's first. In Scrum, it's easy. We do planning. Uh, we do sprint planning all the time. When you're examining your user stories, you're, you're going to be trying to make sure that everybody in your team is, uh, understands them. You are going to be estimating your stories. Why not also have a look at the components, the data flows, and the trust boundaries? Why not have a think about the kind of assets that are moving through your system? Have a think what would happen if that 
asset, that information, was sent to the wrong person, uh, if it was destroyed, lost, what kind of harm would that do? How much scrutiny should, be, should you be paying to the scrutiny on this story? Uh, another good time to do it is during peer review. Um, hopefully a lot of us are using source control. Uh, if you're using Git, good time to do it is during a pull request. Uh, typically you're going to be doing code reviews, make sure that the, uh, sorry, your peers will hopefully be doing some kind of code review. Maybe you've got some standards that you have to comply to. It's also a good time to have a look through the security criteria. Um, don't forget, it's not just about, is that syntactic, syntactic is the syntax correct? <laughs> <laughs> Um, is, is it clean code? Um, are you following solid principles? Are you, are you applying good security practices? Um, hopefully, going through this, the, the, these, uh, these kind of planning and looking at what could possibly go wrong and, and um, what the threats are to your system. Um, with a little bit of luck, you'll end up with a big list. Um, this stride is uh, something Microsoft came up with, helps you categorize those, which might make it easier to keep control of them, to file them, to organize them. Um, I'll go through them quickly. As well as helping you organize them, they might inspire you into thinking about threats that you ha wouldn't otherwise have considered. So stride is an acronym. The S stands for spoofing. Uh, does anybody not know what spoofing is? It's fine if you don't. Good. The T is tampering with data, quite an obvious one. Somebody's going to modify your data, mess with it. Um, what threats fall into that category? When you're looking at a user story, what uh, vulnerability, what, what avenues are there for somebody to tamper with your data? Uh, repudiation, uh, I had to look at this up. Um, what it means is uh, the audit trail, essentially. Dan's nodding, yeah? Yeah, okay, good. So what can somebody do to your system <laughs> is proof, is evidence. What can somebody do to your system without you being able to track that back what, without evidence? Um, so there's a Greg Young. I don't know if anybody watched any of his talk. He's got some really good examples. It's quite, one of his selling points for uh, event sourcing architecture is um, the audit trail, you know, the talk, uh, for I think it was a gambling piece of software. Um, yeah, and he's got a really good one where somebody could have, would have broken his system if they didn't have a perfect audit trail. Information disclosure, it's another category that threats could fall under. What would happen if this information was made public? Denial of service, we're not just talking about DDoS here, which is the one that most people think of. Um, what if an attacker can turn it into your proxy and shut down the machine? That's your service gone. It's not just about distributed denial of service here. Um, anything that can affect the availability of any part of your system is denial of service. E, elevation of privilege. What is preventing people from um, accessing things that require a higher level of privilege? So, like I said, these are just categories to help you try and organize the threats that you come up with and maybe get your mind ticking. Uh, what kind of things could go wrong with my system? What, what are these might apply to my user story? Back to front. <clears throat> Say that we are now starting to build up a list of threats. Um, that doesn't mean that we should act on them immediately. The same thing that we do with any other user story, um, we particularly, not everyone, but in Agile, in Scrum, um, we try to give our product owners some options. We can say, look, we can do this. Um, it's not ideal. It's going to take me a few days. Or I can do this. It's going to last a lot longer. Take me four days. Well, the same is kind of true of threats. Um, you're not going to be able to fix all of them. You could probably spend forever just coming up with random threats for your system. Uh, so the way we measure threats, uh, a threat's priority for, uh, in favor of the product owner is by measuring its risk. Uh, how much risk is there? Uh, and the way we do that is we measure impact versus prob probability of a given threat. Um, there's some tools to help you do this. Uh, you don't just have to put your finger in the air and say, yeah, I think that's a nine arbitrary number. Um, there, there is some stuff to help you do, do this. So DREAD is uh, another acronym that Microsoft came up with, I think. Part of their, their threat modeling came along with STRIDE. Um, the, the D in this stands for damage. What kind of damage would... 
How bad would it be? There we go. <clears throat> um, this is where maybe you do have to start thinking about arbitrary numbers. Well, you could start thinking about arbitrary numbers if you don't want to go too far into this. If you're following, uh, there's some resources, the ISO 27000 family, for example. Um, what they say is for each one of these, um, say for damage, you're going to use the numbers 1 to 3, where 1, or sorry, 0 is it will do almost no harm at all. I don't care. 3, my company's ended. Find, some, find the numbers that suit you. Uh, and try and categorize them. Try and actually come up with a matrix of some kind for each of these. Um, obviously, if it ruins your company, um, that's probably going to be a very high risk and therefore a very high priority. The R is reproducibility. How easy is it to do again? Um, did they just hit F5 in their, in their browser and there you go. <coughs> delete something else, delete something else. Um, the easier it is to do, the higher the probability, the h higher the risk. Uh, you don't want it to be a piece of cake. These are uh, Bing image searches, by the way. That's my theme throughout. If you wonder why I've got the terrible pictures, this is Bing from uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the E stands for exploitability. Uh, how much work is it to perform the attack? Um, so if there is a vulnerability in your system that would do an immense amount of damage to your, your product, your company, your reputation, uh, your finances. If it takes somebody eight years to crack the hashes to perform that attack, then that's a lot of work. That's not so high a risk. If, like it was earlier, uh, if it's just a case of loading up a Chrome browser tab and pressing F5 and that deletes all your data, then that's a very high risk uh, and therefore a very high priority. You want it to make it as much work as possible. Thanks, Bing. The A stands for affected users. So we're back onto damage. Uh, sorry, we're back onto impact here. Damage and affected users uh, is the impact side of the equation, um, and we'll, we'll finish off the <coughs> probability shortly. Uh, affected user is obviously the flip side of damage. Whilst it might not do immense damage to your system, it might do a small amount of damage to a million people. That's going to increase increase the risk and therefore increase the priority of you needing to do that work. Uh, you don't want these guys waiting outside with complaints. The final D, discoverability. How easy is it to find out that there is a problem with your system? How easy is it to find that vulnerability? Um, you don't want this. You don't want somebody to scope how to hack name a company. Top result, there it is. That's how you wreck them. You want to make it as hard as, possi hard as possible for your vulnerabilities to be identified. So, obviously, security is a massive subject. Um, the idea was here was not to give you everything you need to know, it was just to plant some seeds. Uh, what we'd ideally like you to do is go away and have a think about this, um, and here are some resources to help you out. Uh, Wikipedia is actually a really good starting point. Uh, the, the threat link's here, the slides will be available later. Um, this will link off to a load of information. <laughs> Um, similarly, this one unfortunately costs, um, but there is some documentation called the ISO 27000 family. Um, it's not a very long read, it's about 200 bucks for the, for the family. Um, if you can get your company to pay for it, it's so worth doing. Um, we're talking like 60 pages of documentation and you will learn a lot. Uh, there's also something called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. They are a little bit like Wikipedia. They provide lots of information on things like stride and dread and, and threat modeling and threat analysis, threat intelligence, lots of things that I haven't had time to cover. Are there any questions? Good, everybody wants to go home. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got? Uh, first of all, anonymous, how did you get Google to have a black background? How did what? How did you get Google that to have a black background? <laughs> when you were flipping windows around. Oh uh, yeah, okay, that's a... Black background, how do you do that? That is a Chrome theme, search Chrome oh, theme. Chrome theme, cool. Alright. Um, <laughs> on a more serious note. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't paying attention. <laughs> um, what do you think about security in depth and layer security? Yeah, okay, so I haven't actually used the phrase here, but certainly should have done. Um, defense in depth is a, a really key term in security. What it means is especially when you're looking at the probability of something going wrong, uh, whilst 
you can't rely on, say, your firewall preventing your, your servers getting hacked. Yes, that should be the case, but how much harm could be done if somebody gets that far? So every time you're, you're analyzing one of these things, you're not saying, yes, okay, it might be very difficult to get there, but when they do get there, what could they then do? What vulnerabilities would you then have? Follow that tree through your system. Um, that's the point of defense in depth, and actually it's something that we're really bad at. We just, uh, we, we use these, what we believe to be secure technologies, these secure frameworks, these are uh, secure cloud providers. Um, when there's the slightest leak, we have no defense behind that because we've relied on everybody else doing the work for us. Um, you've got to be thinking about what, what would happen if somebody gets through that first layer, if they get through the second layer, how bad is it going to be? Is it worth me doing something about it now? That answer that question, wherever that came from? Yeah. Uh, Is that? Question. Would you start with security for the software, or would you start for security from employee users, i.e. permission controls? Security from software or security? Well, the, the, again, it comes down to the, uh, the dread scoring. Yeah. Um, so it's going to depend on the, the software. So. Um, to repeat the question, I think it was essentially w which is more important, yeah. the uh, security from automated software or s security yeah, of security access control security for users? Um, principles, or would you say in terms of impact and uh, diminishing returns, would you say a good place to start would be around permission controls on, on what access you would like? I mean, they're an absolute minimum. Uh, actually, that's something we'd typically not too bad at, I, I believe, as software developers, is we're quite good at actually implementing user control. As one of our first stories, uh, we say you, you can't have any features until we've put in SP identity. Uh, I see that a lot with uh, products that we're, uh, we've worked on. Um, but we should be scoring it in the same way we do everything else. Like We, sh we shouldn't have done that until we had identified a threat. Um, what's the point of a logging system if all of our inf information is public? Uh, there was no threat there. Any question? Hi. For about commercial penetration testing. Have you What's had that, sorry? Commercial penetration testing. Have you had experience of using it? What did it add? What does it, well, it can. So the, the question is uh, how useful is penetration testing and have I had experience with it? So uh, we actually have somebody, Mark, is training to be a pen, uh, pen tester for us. Um, and it's something that we have been looking at. We. I described earlier how we integrate into Agile the assessment of our software and our security practices. Uh, penetration, penetration testing is another tool for that. Uh, running pen, pen tests will identify threats, uh, which you can then put through the, the dread modeling and determine how important it is to resolve. Um, specifically to .NET, well, specifically to software development, uh, We've identified, identified the best place to do that, we believe, is during CD, continuous deployment, um, as actually one of your deployment steps. So when you hit staging, if you can find some automated penetra penetration testing software, that's a really good place to do it. When you've got your near production configuration all there, your hopefully production um, replica environment, that's a, a really cool place to be doing pen testing. Anything else? Really good resource. Oh, I haven't. No. Okay. Uh, I'm fed up after. Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so that was me. That was the talk. Thank you very much, everybody.